I'm on the bus into town, crawling through traffic. The stench of strangers' sweat, their shite music leaking out their headphones. I ask a lad in front of me to open a window and he looks at me like I've seven heads. Fuck this, I think I can walk into town from here. And when I get off the bus, that's when I notice the air, the feel of it. Like when you're on a foreign holiday before a massive thunderstorm, something oppressive, electric. I'm almost sacked on tariff, pacing it into town, late as per, blonde will kill me. And I think, fuck it, I have to call my mother. I owe it to her to speak to her before a big weekend. I breathe in the sea air, swallow my pride, and dial her number. But of course she doesn't pick up. Fuck's sake, it's like a punch in the stomach. How have I let it get to this? My head is melted. I stare up at the sky and that's when I see this dark, dark grey blanket of angry clouds. clouds swoops in over town. I'm thinking, I'm going to get absolutely drenched and I'm rooting in my bag for my umbrella. And when I look up, I lock eyes with this girl. She's sitting outside Tara Street Station and at first I think she's homeless. But then I see her sign, like the oceans we rise. She's one of those protesters. She looks possessed, like she's fucking seen something. something. is weird about the sky. It looks as pissed off as me, like it's gonna open up and drown me. Typical. I'm stony broke, but I'm gonna have to get a taxi. I'm about to order one when I glance out to sea, and I do a double take and wonder, am I drunk? Because I can't see the sea at all. It's miles away. I've never seen the tide so far out. Something's, Something's not right. There's this huge clap of thunder that seems to make the ground shake and suddenly people are sprinting, screaming, all the suits are shoving past me. I am like a salmon going up street. I think it's an attack, a bomb, but people are yelling about a wave and in the mayhem I just freeze. I'm paralyzed, I just I just stand, stand there. there on the shore stock still. This is some full moon tidal shit. I mean the water is way out past the pool back towers and that's when I feel a tremor. The whole ground is shaking now. A, a fucking, fucking earthquake, earthquake in, in Dublin? Dublin? Town is chaos. People are leaping into cars, driving like maniacs. Someone yells that the Liffey has burst its banks. But how can that be? And I've had panic attacks before and I can feel one coming on now. My breath is shallow and this lad beside me grabs my arm. Run, he yells, and I drop my bag and start sprinting. I'm sprinting now. I'm on autopilot. The adrenaline is like rocket fuel. I'm afraid to look behind me because I know what I'll see. A wall of grey sea charging towards me. I, I take out my phone and I'm dialing Blonnet's number. It's over. over. And it's over. over. My life is fucking over. This is the end and all I can think of is proud stampeding at football matches and the walls are juddling, rattling, they're closing in on me and my phone is ringing now and I'm fumbling in my pocket but my hands are jelly. Blonde, are you okay? Yes. Where are you? I'm in town. Look, we need to get to high ground, okay? I don't know what to do. Look, I'll find you, just listen to me. Run! Storms come more often nowadays. The sea turns from blue to black without warning and the whole building shakes as the waves smash into it. I can hear it creaking at night, you know, this old pirate ship tossed on the waves. Already it must be rusting. The foundation's rotten. It's our home now, but it can't last forever. I know the storms are just a natural phenomenon, but it's so hard not to take them personally. Me and Debs are like cockroaches, the last dregs of humanity clinging on till the bitter end. We're like that old couple in Titanic, holding hands till death do us part. I feel the thunder in my bones. The lightning goes through me. Every flash is like a flashback to my old life, to everything I never did. I was so useless, I couldn't even give up dairy. I could not imagine my life without full fat milk on my cornflakes. And if I could do it all again, I would. I would fight for the planet, for, for the brilliant, beautiful people of Dublin and Ireland and the world. I would, I would protest. 
I'd chain myself to the doll. I would swim in the sea and travel the world, but I wouldn't fly. I swear to God, I wouldn't fly. It's okay, ma'am. It's all right. Don't worry. No, Deb, don't use the light. It's a waste of the battery. Oh, sure. He'd be texting us anyway, Blonde. It's official. We have no friends. Even your dealer stopped texting me. I'm just so sad, Deb. Like, Dublin's lost forever. Like, it was such a unique, historic, authentic city. And now, just like that, it's, it's submerged under 60 meters of water, I know. Honestly, we were living in paradise, and we never stopped to appreciate it. I know, Blonde. What? Dublin was paradise, yeah. And then God saw that it had all gone to shite and sent down a flood. Don't say that, Deb. Dublin was my home. Yeah, it was mine too. Look, all I'm saying, Dublin... Dublin was... was the perfect mix of the traditional and the international. Delicious, creamy pints of Guinness and Doyles, followed by mouth-watering bimimbap and kimchi. I get my hair done by my mom's OAP hairdresser, uh, Maura Brophy, and then I head into town to dance the night away in Tengu. Didn't that place close at like 11? Balia or Haklia, a bustling city where the bus drivers were sound. Ah, uh, when they weren't busy mowing down cyclists. And the bouncers were really banterful. Ah, uh, really fucking creepy. A nation steeped in history, the ground teeming with ancient secrets, myths and folklore. Oh, a culture exported all across the globe, along with all of our young people. Dublin was teeming with writers, musicians, poets. Oh, struggling, starving artists, barely existing off the door, creating work the government would never fund and you would never engage with. And um, that is not true. I loved conversations with friends. <laughs> a progressive nation was born, marriage equality and abortions for all. Oh, cobwebs well and truly blown away. Mother and baby homes converted into co-working spaces without so much as a whisper. Yeah, all right, Debs, I get it. Nowhere's perfect. All I'm saying is Dublin was more woke than ever. Like, you could barely make it down O'Connell Street without bumping into like young, inspiring climate protesters. Oh, so did you subvert them? Actually take part in any of the protests? Well, no, obviously I couldn't make it down because of... I was 20 minutes late for Pilates because of those fucking hippies on O'Connell Street. Blanket O'Rourke, September 2022. Oh, and what's this? Another lecture from Armchair Activist of the Year, Deborah O'Malley. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but the last time I checked, Watching TED talks about dying insect populations while off your tits on rosé didn't count as doing anything either. Look, I know I, I could have been better. I could have done more. Yeah, we both could have done a lot more. We got what we deserved, Blonde. A life sentence up here alone. I'm <laughs> um, my love. By the gasworks wall Dream the dream by the Oh my goodness, what an incredible start. I could have done more. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that brief excerpt from a float. Um, a really compelling and thought-provoking uh, piece on loss, sisterhood and climate anxiety. It's by Eva O'Connor and Hildegard Ryan of the Sunday's Child Theatre Company. Uh, it was performed this morning by Eva and by Annette O'Shea. Um, they were simply fantastic. What an incredible start. Um, a float uh, featured earlier this year last May as part of the inaugural Future Limerick Climate Arts Festival. And it was one of five arts um, projects across Ireland, which received funding from the ESB Brighter Future Funds Arts Fund. It's an incredible fund which was established to support artists and arts organisations actively engaging their local communities um, on the issues of climate change, sustainability and the energy transition. And I think you will all agree that that has really, really set the scene this morning for our conference. Thanks to Hildegard, Eva and Annette for joining us here this morning. That was superb. Um, I suppose I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Derv MacDonald. Um, I'll be the MC for today's conference. And on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs and ESB, I'm delighted to welcome you all here this morning to accelerate the transition to a net zero future. We're delighted to be uh, hosting this conference in person, although many people will be joining us virtually, um, here in the wonderful round room at the Mansion House. 
Um, throughout the day, we're going to be hearing from a range of distinguished voices who will highlight how community empowerment and innovative technologies can accelerate cross-sectoral transformations of our society and lead to a clean energy future where no one is left behind. And we hope that today's conference will showcase all of the, um, the vision of a resilient and inclusive and a sustainable future for everyone as the journey to net zero continues. Um, one word you're going to be hearing a lot about today is community. And I think, you know, especially over the last couple of days, there's one community that we will all be thinking about, and that is Chrysler, which has lost 10 of its citizens of that small community, many more injured, and a community really just dealing with an incalculable loss. And I just thought that it might be fitting just to pause for a brief moment's silence for the community of Chrysler. Thank you very much. Our thoughts are certainly with them today. Um, before we go in, let's just get a few housekeeping uh, notes out of the way. The fire exits in this hall, uh, the one that you come in through, through the back door, there's also one to my right and to my left. That's where I get to do my um, Aer Lingus thing, but you'll see them. They're all highlighted, and I think in the event of an evacuation, you'll meet out at St. Anne's on Dawson Street. So just maybe just to, to note them. If you could put your phones onto silent mode, we'd really appreciate it, but you can tweet about the conference and join the conversation online using the hashtag Accelerate to Net Zero which you can see here. On your lanyard, you'll see a QR code, and that's where, if you scan it using your camera function, you'll be able to access the full conference, um, as well as time for coffee breaks and lunch, which is my primary job to get you to those on time today. Uh, we'll have a few, a uh, couple of short coffee breaks over the course of the day, and lunch will take uh, place at one o'clock. It'll be served here in the round room. Um, the conference should conclude at about uh, 10 to 5 this afternoon, and it's going to have five sessions. We'll explore the policy landscape for net zero. We'll examine the geopolitical elements of the framework for carbon neutrality. We'll assess the importance of the just transition. And we'll also look at emerging technologies and examine how we're going to accelerate the pace of decarbonisation across the entire energy value chain. Finally, our last session will look at the critical question of community empowerment during the decades of change as we accelerate to those net zero emissions by mid-century. So now um, that's it, just a little bit of an overview of today. I'm delighted to welcome Senior Counsel Alex White to the stage to deliver the, today's opening remarks. He is the co-chair of the IAEA's Climate Change and Energy Working Group. He's a Senior Counsel and Mediator, but of course, he previously served as Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources, uh, and prior to that was Minister of State for Primary Care. So without further ado, Alex, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, um, Dervil, and it's great to have you with us today, and uh, thanks for being here to guide us through um, our business. And as you've said, all of our thoughts are with the um, people in Donegal and Chrysler in particular, and particularly the, the families that have been affected by that awful tragedy. And I can only hope, like as you've said, that they will draw some comfort and strength from the extraordinary community response and solidarity that um, has been so visible in Donegal uh, over the weekend past. It's an honour for me to welcome you, to join with Dervil and welcome you here to this uh, historic round room at the Mansion House for today's uh, conference, Accelerate the Transition to a Net Zero Future. On behalf of the IIEA, I'd like to begin by thanking the ESB for their generous sponsorship of this conference and indeed to recognise their long-standing support for the Institute uh, of International and European Affairs. I think it demonstrates that, as well as being our leading energy company, ESB values debate, values interaction, and the sharing of insights on the big questions that we're all wrestling with in the energy transition. A lot has happened uh, in the time since the IIEA and the ESB hosted a similar conference at this venue in 2019, believe it or not, three years ago. The COVID-19 pandemic was, of course, a global, a major global event. It led to an extraordinary mobilization of whole societies 
in the face of what was a real and present danger. Of course, the threat posed by climate change is also real and, in truth, just as present. So there are many lessons from the COVID period that could and indeed must be employed if we are to accelerate the transition to net zero. But just at the time when societies and governments could perhaps have absorbed and started to, as it were, capitalize on some of that potential for rapid mobilization, we were confronted by a different kind of threat, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That event, as well as disrupting the lives of so many people and undermining the international order, has threatened to destabilize the pathway to net zero emissions and to undo progress and cooperation on climate action. I say threatened because I do not for a moment believe that it is inevitable or necessary that that will be the outcome. The idea that you could never let a good crisis go to waste became a rather hackneyed insight during the financial crisis and again with COVID, but it has perhaps never been a more valid call to action as it is today. We are, of course, all too conscious of the impact of the war on energy security, and we know that hardship and disruption seem inevitable this winter and perhaps beyond. But we can also see that there is genuine opportunity too. Not that war can ever be a good thing, but it does bring with it a manifest opportunity to move much more quickly than had been planned to end our dependence on fossil fuels, and not just Russian fossils. It emphasizes the critical importance of scaling up the transition to renewable energy. And it also points, I believe, to the need for strategies to permanently reduce energy demand beyond the immediate crisis. It's important, too, to recognize that progress has occurred, so much progress that has occurred since we last met in this room in 2019. During that period, the European Union committed to becoming climate neutral by 2050. The European Green Deal is now the EU's growth strategy, including, as it does, a host of measures to design, uh, designed to reconcile the economy with the planet. Indeed, in the period since 2019, there has been a global acceleration in commitments to meet net zero by mid-century. Today, in the closing months of 2022, economies representing almost 90% of the world's gross domestic product have set net zero targets. And here in Ireland, too, enormous progress has been made in the period since 2019, and that must be recognised. And I have no hesitation as a former Minister for Energy in recognising the step change that has occurred in the policy arena uh, on this agenda in the period, uh, the, last, the period of the last two to three years. Enormously encouraging and uh, hugely scaled up leadership at the political level in this country has occurred in that short period. That government and this government, I believe, have done things that no previous government seemed able to do and that must be acknowledged and must be recognised. It is not only governments and world leaders who have declared net zero commitments. As we know, every sector of the economy will need to decarbonise if we are to keep to the limits set out in the Paris Agreement. Earlier this year, the ESB released its landmark strategy, Driven to Make a Difference, in which they pledged to become net zero by 2040. And I'd like to commend Paddy Hayes, um, Chief Executive of the ESB, from whom we'll hear in a little while, for his decisive leadership on this agenda. While we should recognize progress, it is also the case that we face really profound challenges. In the years before Paris, and indeed since, much of the debate has been about targets, how extensive, how well distributed across different sectors within countries, and how to ensure fairness and equity for poorer countries and their citizens. But you know, we're in another kind of transition now too. And that is the transition from debating and arguing about targets to deciding what to do when carbon budgets are not met. Instead of falling, emissions in Ireland rose by 5% last year, and there are indications they could rise again in 2022. As Professor Hannah Daly of UCC has pointed out, this will necessitate far greater annual reductions to stay under carbon budget one even, 
potentially up to 14% in 2023, 2024, and 2025. As Daly said, and I quote, delayed early action necessitates steeper cuts later, unquote. How will we handle this? How will society respond? How will our political system respond? Many of these themes and concerns are reflected in our programme today. As Derbel has said, over the course of, of five sessions, we'll hear from a whole host of speakers addressing a range of, uh, uh, of areas uh, on, on this uh, critical agenda. So on behalf of the IIEA and ESB, I'd like to thank each and every one of our speakers uh, for joining us at this Accelerate event. Uh, many of them, have, as Derbel has said, will, will take the stage here physically. And isn't it great, I'm sure you'll agree, that we have that opportunity and possibility for, in, for that interaction again. Some of our contributors are joining virtually, as you've heard. And I think it's also great that we have the facility to hear from people who might not otherwise have been able to join us. And then as a bonus to save on the emissions that will be involved in flying those distinguished speakers long distances across the Atlantic and from elsewhere. So the best of both worlds, in a sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time to accelerate the transition to a net zero future. I'm really looking forward to the day ahead. Thank you very much for being with us here today. Well, our first keynote speaker is the Minister of State, Oshin Smith, TD, um, and we're delighted to have you here with us. He is Minister of State at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, serves as a TD representing Dunleary constituency for the Green Party. Minister Smith, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Sterville. Good morning, everybody. And um, nice to see Alex White again. It's good that climate change is not a partisan issue in Ireland and that all parties um, basically want the same thing and that the debate is now about how to get there rather than what we're trying to do. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to have any discussions with, uh, with Alex White that he wants to have because I know he has a lot of experience in this area in the past. I'm here today as a junior minister in the Department of Environment because Eamon Ryan can't be here Eamon is at the moment in London meeting Jacob Rees-Mogg, who uh, has taken on the challenge of being the new energy minister in the UK. And uh, I think he'd be well up to it. His, his previous role um, as minister for uh, Brexit opportunities must have been uh, equally challenging. So um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and, I, and I have to say about the British that they, they, they really did succeed in the last decade in a way that we did not. They managed to dramatically reduce their, their greenhouse gas emissions, probably by 25%, I think, during that time, at a time when they were growing their economy. So, we, you know, it, we, it is worth talking to them. It is worth learning from their experience. And at the heart of, every, of all of this climate action, and it's good that ESB is here today, at the heart of climate action is electricity. Um, a lot of what's happening is replacing smokestacks uh, with uh, electrical motors. So really, that's, that's, that's a lot of what has to happen. If you were to summarize climate action, because when you look at climate action for a lot of people, it's this huge mountain uh, that's difficult to break down. But really, it, what it comes down to is reducing agricultural emissions on one hand and reducing energy emissions on the other. So we look at agriculture in a second. With energy, what, what we're thinking about is changing the way that we heat our homes and how we cool our homes, uh, changing the way that we do our transport. So, and both the answers in those cases are, are electricity. So we're moving away from burning oil and gas to heat our home towards, or burning solid fuel, towards having heat pumps. And we can see already, 80% um, of new houses have heat pumps. Uh, and if you're thinking about that, we're building 300,000 homes in a decade. So, you know, that's, that's whatever that is, quarter of a million heat pumps just from new homes alone. 99% of our new homes are A-rated at this stage. So, you know, there is a dramatic transformation happening where, where we're moving from um, heating homes with, with fossil fuels, with solid fuels, generating CO2 towards heating our homes with electricity. And a lot of that electricity generated within the house itself, one hopes, with solar panels. With transport, I think when you think of electrifying transport, immediately people think of electric vehicles. It's equally important to get all our public transport. If you think about including taxis and buses, these are the vehicles that drive around the very heavily, densely populated city center. They're creating a lot of pollution as well, but they're also very visible and they set an example. 
I'm glad that we're now getting um, fully electric double-decker buses uh, coming in, a lot, very large grants, 25,000 euros for a, to, to convert a taxi to electric. But also, equally important, is that we are getting people onto electric bicycles, which are really a game changer for a lot of people. For a lot of people where, where their distance is a little bit too far to go, where their terrain is a little bit hilly, uh, they're getting on in years, or they've got some disability, or they're trying to carry a lot of children, having a little electric motor on a bicycle really, really makes all the difference. And it's easy to kind of focus on the changing from fossil fuel cars to electric cars, but it's equally important to get people onto electric bikes. And I'm delighted to see that ESB has made moves in this. I think they've got some new service called ESB e-bikes, which I haven't had time. I've already, I've, there are four bike sharing schemes going on in my own county at this stage. So it's something that's really, really is catching on. And if you go abroad, you go to another city. I did a bit of interrail this year, and every city I went to was just a mass of people on scooters and electric bikes and electric cars and every type of mobility possible. And finally, agriculture. And agriculture really got in the news this summer because there was all this stuff about what's the percentage reduction going to be for farmers for agriculture when we were setting the sectoral emission ceilings. Um, to what extent will they have to cut their emissions? And the, the debate was, was really kind of sort, of sort of, I felt it was sort of surreal because people were talking about whether there should be a 23% or a 25% or a 27% cut in emissions without really defining what that was. I mean, what, what were we cutting from and to? What, what are we defining as emissions in agriculture? And what actions will the farmers have to take to, to get those cuts? And will those actions be positive or negative? And that really wasn't explored. There was a huge debate about what the number would, would be without any idea of what the number actually meant. And at the end, the compromise was that um, they set a number. I think it was 25. But in addition to this, um, there, would be a, there would be a large increase in the amount of solar and a large increase in the amount of anaerobic digestion, both of which in practice would happen on farms, but would not be counted as part of the agricultural sectoral emissions. Um, but farmers obviously playing a huge role. So we're moving toward, I mean, the, product, the, the prediction is that we'll do 5.7 terawatt hours of, uh, of, of electricity per year from anaerobic digestion alone, which I think, which I think is coming up to 20% of our, our electrical generation in a year. Um, I think when people think of agriculture, they think the opportunity in agriculture for climate change is to plant a lot of trees, and forestry is a great thing, and we're a very under-forested country, and forestation has to be a huge target. It's a nice thing to have, but we can see that there is a huge risk with this. We can see that as climate change takes hold, forest fires can happen very rapidly. You know, you can, you can burn a tree much faster than you can grow one and there is a risk there. And also we see with things like ash dieback and Dutch elm disease that entire tree species can be wiped out very quickly. So it's something to do, but it's not something to rely on. Last year was a massive year for, for um, changes in, in our approach to climate change. We had our, our new Climate Act, uh, which um, put in law that we had to reduce our emissions 51% by 2030, and also set that, uh, that climate neutrality, that net, net zero target for 2050, which was sort of inconceivable in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was being looked at. It was thought of to be a, a, a really far-fetched thing for the world to reach for. And now, now net zero is seen as normal or seen as accepted. Um, setting, the, setting a law that, set, that predicts a, tar, a, a particular target or puts it into law is not enough. There also has to be a series of steps that make it really happen. And that's what the Climate Action Plan was from last year. A new climate action plan is being done now. It has to be constantly updated. And the new climate action plan will be launched later this year, and it will be much more um, specific and shorter, and it will have more numbers in it, and it will be more, more measurable. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Also, when I'm, I, the, the, the climate action plans, of course, always have to have a lot of actions for the government to take, and the government, the public sector, and so on can never excuse itself from the, from the things that it's asking the public to do. So, and, and that includes the semi-states and so on. We do, do need to be leading by example. If you're having large organizations that are driving around in, in fossil fuel cars or something, it, it doesn't send the right message. In order to get all this stuff to happen, we also need to get the public on side and we need to get buy-in and we need to go out to people and say, what is it that you want from this? What do you believe? Uh, what do you want to happen? What are you, what are you, what are you willing to do? And that's why there's a national dialogue on climate action. And there's, there are really sort of three strands to that. There's a general 
uh, attempt to, to, to survey and to do focus groups on as many people as possible, and I think they talked to more than 4,000 people last year. Then there, there are, there's a national stakeholder forum where you take all the different groups in civil society and ask them what their views are. That meets three times a year. And there's a national youth assembly because um, you know, the, the two young people who were up at the start, it, it is our generation and my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation who really created this problem. It probably was the right thing to do at the time, but we need to move on and we do have a debt to our children and to our grandchildren. Outside the Doyle every Friday, there are people protesting, and they have been for, for two years, mostly young people. And um, the, 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 like, the, the only reason I'm here is because some of those young people talk to their, their parents and their grandparents and ask them to vote for me. So, you know, they, they, this, is, um, this is something that is an intergenerational debt and an obligation and something we have to do. We have to listen to people, and we have to find out from them what their ideas are and what they're willing to do. And the, the, the messages that are coming back are that people are uh, very aware that climate change is happening. Um, over 85% of people say they're worried. 37% of people say they're very worried. People want uh, a speed up in, um, in, renew in renewable energy. And of course, this has all changed since the war started at the start of the year. Now I'm really feeling an intensity in that demand for a speed up in, uh, in renewable energy not because of climate change, but because of energy independence and sovereignty and risk to supply. There's a feeling that we cannot rely on Russia or on the Middle East to keep our country running. We need to have our offshore wind farms, we need to have our solar farms, uh, we need to have our anaerobic digestion, and why haven't we done it already, and can't we do it faster? And that brings into focus questions about the planning system. I mean, the idea of planning is that you sit down and work out what you're going to do beforehand so that it all works more smoothly. And yet it has come to be seen as uh, an obstruction, as something that makes it harder to do things if, if it weren't there in the first place. And when people think about planning, they're thinking about the planning permission and determination system, the consenting and permitting, the, uh, the, the part where somebody sits down who's a planner and either grants permission or refuses permission. Whereas planning really should be about making plans, making your county development plan or your strategic plans, your energy plans, and so on. Our, our planning system is sometimes seen as being too discretionary, as uh, not being objective. Um, and when it's not objective, then it can be seen as arbitrary and something that introduces an element of risk. And it's not known how long it's going to take to come to its decisions. And there's generally a problem there. When you're in an emergency, and if we really are in a climate emergency, then we need a rapid response. And we saw during the pandemic, suddenly a whole lot of things had to be shortened. A lot of processes had to be sped up because we needed to get a response quickly. And there will have to be changes. There will have to be a large overhaul uh, in the planning system. Now, we need to retain fairness and due process. But at the same time, we need to take out some of the randomness and the risk and the unpredictability of the system. Uh, and I'd like to see it move more towards a rules-based system and away from being um, a discretionary or subjective system. Climate change is a, is a you know, it, it is a, a classic uh, tragedy of the commons problem. We all share one atmosphere in the world, and if you dump things into it, just like dumping things into the sea, we all share the problem. And so we can't achieve anything without international cooperation. And, you know, this will involve things like making cables to other countries, it will involve a lot of meeting, it will involve looking at other countries and seeing what they have done and whether they've done better than us, and whether we can copy things from them. And that's why it's actually important that Eamon is in uh, London today meeting Jacob Rees-Mogg. He'll be in Brussels the next day uh, at a European meeting, and because the Czechs have the presidency of the council, he'll be, he'll be in the Czech Republic uh, on Wednesday. And at all of those things, all of those meetings are about um, finding a common response and being stronger together, coming together to fix this. So thank you very much, everybody, for having me here. I'm really looking forward to hearing the, um, the different perspectives from different speakers, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister, for setting uh, out that path to 2030 and 2050. And um, you spoke about how people's anxieties had been aggravated by the current um, 
war in Ukraine. And I think we all woke up to the horror this morning of fresh missile strikes in Kiev this morning. Um, if it was a period of great fertility in the international energy markets, it's even more so. It's having obviously an, uh, an impact on the wholesale price of energy and has impacted the security of supply of energy here in Ireland and elsewhere. It's a hugely significant topic and uh, we're very, very lucky that our next speaker is going to address this issue and consider the impact of the war on the net zero trajectory. We're delighted, uh, she's going to join us virtually, uh, we're, we're delighted of Laura Kutsi, the Chief Energy Modeller at the International Energy Agency with us this morning. She oversees the agency's work on outlooks and forecasts and is in charge of overall consistency of modeling work and those resulting messages. She's the head of the Demand Outlook Division with responsibility of producing the annual World Energy Outlook, um, which is the IEA's flagship publication. I think it is uh, most fortuitous that we have her with us this morning. So Laura, the uh, virtual floor is yours. You're very welcome. Good morning, good morning everyone. It's a great pleasure to, um, to be with you, to be with you today. Uh, we have started this, uh, this conference in a very, very, um, very strong way with this wonderful um, piece of, uh, of theatre that really talks about the, the issue of, uh, of climate change. Uh, have you then heard uh, um, that today we are really living in a, uh, in a double crisis, uh, certainly the, the climate crisis, uh, um, but I would like to start um, really discussing uh, uh, what many families in Europe uh, and many uh, SMEs around Europe are suffering today, which is really high energy prices. And um, um, we, uh, we have heard the topic at the beginning about, uh, uh, about communities. Um, and the way I would like to start the speech is about uh, uh, narratives. Uh, uh, it seems to me um, that having the right narrative nowadays, um, the way we speak to the public, uh, the way we speak to the communities, the, the way we speak with individuals is gonna be key uh, to go through this winter, the coming winter, and then certainly uh, for the fights uh, for the clean energy transition going, uh, going forward. Uh, I'm starting this way because uh, uh, we are really feeling um, high energy prices. Uh, um, some families uh, are having difficulties paying their bills at the, end of the, at the end of the month. Many SMEs had to close because they were not able to pay their bills um, and getting the reason of the crisis right and why we are paying these high energy bills um, and the way we explain it to the public is, uh, is crucial. Not everyone is doing this in the right way. So I'd like to start exactly exactly with that. So we are living in a uh, what we call the first global energy crisis. We have lived in the 70s, very high oil prices. Today, uh, we see high natural gas prices, high oil prices, high coal prices. is really touching not only Europe, but is being really spread uh, throughout the world. Uh, inflation numbers are skyrocketing, and we are seeing the first impact on the global economy um, being felt um, with uh, uh, many areas of the world maybe facing recession at the beginning of, of next year. Why do we find ourselves in this situation? Well, uh, we were seeing uh, uh, energy pricing rising last year uh, as post-COVID uh, the economy grew. But really, the key reason why we are in this situation uh, has been uh, manipulative behavior uh, from Russia towards, uh, towards Europe. Already starting in September, you can see that in this graph, we have uh, our data that show, show very clearly that Russia started to uh, decrease um, the amount of uh, gas flowing through Europe already uh, in September, to the point that in December, our executive director, well before there were talks of, of war, said that it was unusual that he would see uh, Gazprom withholding maybe a third of what the normal supplies would be, while at the same time we were seeing um, tanks getting closer to the, to the Ukraine border. Uh, price skyrocketed uh, uh, around the time of the invasion. And what we see now is what we call a structural uncertainty. For us, the very high gas prices that we're seeing today are part of a increased geopolitical tension around gas. Similarly, we are seeing that around fossil fuels. And this for us is really the root cause of these high prices. Some people are in, in, in some quarters saying that the clean energy transition um, has, has been uh, a, a cause of, this, uh, of these high prices. We have very clear analysis that shows that within Europe, the countries that are feeling the least 
uh, the increase in prices are the ones where renewables in power generation have the highest shares. So uh, the countries that have moved further and further on uh, diversifying the electricity mix towards renewables, that have moved the further and the furthest on um, retrofitting our buildings and pushing ahead on energy efficiency, are the ones that see the lowest uh, impact. Europe has moved. It has moved from the beginning of the year uh, on three pillars. First, storage levels for gas uh, are very high level, 90% um, in many of the European countries. At the same time, as diversified uh, the supplies you see here. Uh, we have significantly increased uh, European imports of liquefied na natural gas from, uh, from the US to levels that we had never seen before. Uh, we have diversified from other sources, being uh, North Africa, being uh, the Caspian region. We were only also a bit lucky uh, because, as you can see it there, uh, China and some part of Asia used less uh, gas than they had contracted, so we could make use of, uh, uh, of this gas. So I would say the Europe at large, uh, we've also heard from, uh, from the minister, is moving in a, in a coherent uh, manner certainly done a lot on, uh, on supplies, certainly done a lot on, on storage. We would like to see more happening on uh, demand, and in particular, through to this uh, winter, uh, we are seeing some countries starting to use uh, and suggest colleagues to do, um, colleagues and citizens uh, to do behavior changes to make uh, gas supplies available uh, for, um, uh, for others and to try to keep uh, prices as low as possible. At the same time, what we are seeing, we have heard this from the from the minister, is actually that uh, the response is pretty clear and is uh, going in a very clear direction. And it's accelerating clean energy transition in a structural manner. So what I'm showing you here is actually, if you look around the globe, how much money governments have mobilized for clean energy transitions. This has not happened uh, yesterday. It started to happen post-COVID. Um, countries around the world have started um, putting money to support an acceleration of uh, sustainable re recoveries and at large clean energy transitions. How much money are we talking about? So we're talking uh, in excess of 1.1 trillion euros, you will ask, is that much? Yes, it is. If you compare this with the amount of money that was mobilized on green recoveries immediately after the financial crisis, we are already at twice as much. Who is responsible for this? Well, one third is uh, certainly the European Union. This is excellent. Uh, but Europe is not alone here moving ahead. There is the United States in August has signed uh, an hugely important Inflation Reduction Act, which puts on the table nearly 400 billions for uh, clean energy and is really accelerating, and we're seeing this uh, very dramatically, cost reduction for uh, clean energy technologies, new and existing ones. So just to give you a bit, uh, a couple of, of examples. Uh, our expectation now, uh, this only looks at, at cars, uh, but we have heard uh, previously buses. Uh, if we had shown this for buses, we could see even a steeper increase. The economic case for buses is even stronger than that of, of cars. But our latest expectation after we have seen uh, this move, and I use this again as just as an example of how we're seeing an acceleration of clean energy transitions. By 2030, our expectation is that in the three largest car markets in the world, the EU, the US and China, one car in two will be electric, just in eight uh, years of uh, time. This means that we, are, we have really re reached the tipping point, and for this part of uh, the clean energy transition, we are almost going now in autopilot and see these huge increases going forward. I'm not mentioning solar and wind, because uh, uh, we had seen Ireland certainly being one of the of the leading countries here for, uh, for wind, but we're seeing um, renewables, especially solar, especially wind, uh, breaching records year after year after year. And if, if at the beginning, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, there was certainly 
uh, a huge climate component into uh, pushing uh, renewables in the electricity systems. Today, it's very clear that uh, there are three key areas that renewables uh, fit is certainly the fight against climate change, but certainly the energy security aspect, more and more uh, going into increasingly volatile uh, fossil fuel prices. Renewables are sheltering uh, consumers from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from high prices on the one hand, so uh, the affordability issue, and on the other issue, helping the countries to be uh, more su su sufficient and uh, uh, increasingly uh, energy uh, independent. Um, now, if we look at Europe uh, in, in general, what is our, our suggestions, what, what is our uh, uh, expectation? So we have heard uh, from, from Mr. Minister talking about uh, the Green Deal, fifth of 55, and on top of that, uh, repower EU. So for us, uh, agreeing on all portion of the fifth of 55 and possibly on the repower EU is going to be critical. As you can see there, basically, uh, we would see a demand reduction that will certainly help getting off uh, Russian gas and getting off Rush, uh, gas in general and fossil fuels in general over time to meet the net zero by 2050. So there is really a huge priority in agreeing on those, uh, on those targets and then moving strongly on, on implementation. We are quite optimistic about uh, how things are moving on, uh, on the electricity side, we are seeing permitting uh, across Europe as, uh, as, being, as being an issue. So uh, making sure that on the one hand, uh, uh, the renewable pipeline is uh, approved quickly, and on the other hand, the necessary uh, strengthening of uh, the grids is done to allow for increasing electricity, um, electri electricity demand that is coming from new, those new um, uh, areas like electric vehicles. For us, the key priority for this winter, the coming winter, the winter following, is really going to be tackling head-on um, the heating system. Heating system, we have left this uh, a bit behind. Uh, we need to work uh, uh, all together to accelerate buildings renovation and to move very, very strongly on uh, heat pumps and other forms of cleaner uh, buildings uh, uh, across Europe depending on the national circumstances. But it has to become immediately a huge, a huge priority. Uh, let me uh, conclude uh, with, um, with two thoughts. One, again, going back uh, on, uh, on the narrative. Uh, I think certainly um, uh, IIEA, ESB, that have put together this, uh, uh, this wonderful uh, conference, uh, but there is a role for all of us uh, to play, to communicate. Uh, we are all, uh, in a way, um, experts in, the, in, in this subject, but going out and communicate in the right way with the public, with the community, to make sure that we get this narrative right about uh, the clean energy transitions. Um, unfortunately, in, in some countries in Europe, uh, this has been a bit distorted, so I really encourage everyone to, as much as possible, go out, talk to the newspapers, uh, and make sure that, uh, uh, that the narrative is aligned. But the concluding point that I would like to uh, stop uh, on is uh, solidarity. There are a couple of, uh, uh, of different uh, uh, ways uh, this winter can, uh, can go. Uh, there are some uh, parts of the winter with that, uh, uh, that the policy response that we, we can control, what we are doing with storage, what we are doing with, uh, uh, with policies, uh, what we are doing uh, with new supplies. Others we cannot control. If it's going to be a harsh winter or not, we cannot control. Uh, but we see a bifurcation, a bifurcation that is, on the one hand, Europe acts in, a, uh, in solidarity, finding common solutions, uh, and being um, really uh, at the root cause of what Europe is, is about and the solidarity principle winning. The solidarity works at the big level, so at the EU level, but also at community level. Um, so uh, being really um, responsive to who is most in need. And for us, the solidarity test is the one that is going to be proving whether Europe is coming out winning or not. 
uh, but on something we uh, are really confident uh, that the acceleration is happening, happening is structural energy transitions. You've seen the number uh, that we have here on the investments, uh, on um, the policy push, uh, but also on the interest of, uh, of companies. So um, we are overall positive that is moving in the right direction. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, as Alex said, there are no upsides to war, but it is heartening to see that the uh, Ukraine war is accelerating that clean energy transition in a structural manner, as Laura outlined. And I think something we'll be taking away throughout the rest of our discussions from Laura is that solidarity and the way we speak to people is going to be key. And um, we've come now to the final speaker of the first session. Bear with me. Um, I'm going to welcome Paddy Hayes, CEO of ASB, to the stage uh, shortly. Uh, he's going to produce the final pre presentation of this first session. We'll have a second and then I'll let you go for uh, tea and coffee on time, I promise. Uh, before he was ESB Chief Executive, Paddy headed up uh, two of ESB's main operation divisions, Executive Director of Generational and Wholesale Markets, and then as Managing Director of ESB Networks. Earlier this year, ESB launched their new strategy, setting out its net zero target for 2040. But today, Paddy is going to talk about the role of clean electricity in supporting climate targets and the steps that ESB has taken to accelerate that transition. So you're very welcome, Paddy. Thank um, thanks very much, Derval. And um, thanks as well, uh, Minister, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. We know that you have a really busy agenda and um, we really uh, value your time here this morning, um, setting out the challenges and the opportunities to lead the transition to net zero. Um, Dave August Walter of Galair, it's um, my pleasure to uh, add my welcome to that of, of Alex um, and on behalf of ESP welcome you all to, to the conference. Um, it's a real privilege for us to be working with the IIEA. Um, they uh, bring such a wonderful uh, range of uh, international speakers and perspectives and a range of diverse and challenging perspectives as well and we really uh, appreciate that and we appreciate the dialogue and the, uh, the challenge and I think it's really important. Um, the need to uh, accelerate the transition to net zero has taken on an even greater urgency and of course a greater complexity uh, since we began planning this conference with the IIEA earlier on this year. And now in addition to the existential threat of climate change, we're also facing the cost of living crisis driven by soaring energy costs. And um, as we heard from Laura just now, uh, Russia's decision to invade Ukraine, amongst other things, has created this massive price volatility in the wholesale gas market, and it's contributing to security supply concerns for energy, uh, not just in Ireland, but right the way across Europe. In Ireland, we currently use gas to generate about 50% of our electricity. So uh, this volatility in gas prices is feeding directly into much higher prices for the Irish and, of course, for European consumers. And in fact, as Laura, Laura has shown, it's actually feeding into, into other markets around the world. It's a really complex and challenging time for the energy sector. It's particularly challenging for our customers, um, particularly given that the outlook remains so uncertain. And we're doing what we can to support our customers through this, uh, through this crisis. But it truly is a crisis of international, European, and national dimensions. And so we, we really welcome the government's important announcement recently in the budget about support, direct supports for uh, both domestic and business customers with their, with their energy bills. We think it's really important that this is something that's being addressed at European and national level. So while the context for this conference has changed, the subject matter is just as relevant, if not more so than ever. And accelerating the transition to zero carbon electricity means gaining independence from costly gas imports. And today, while I think it's become more difficult uh, to deliver and more challenging, and despite the cost of living crisis and the costs that we're seeing in the economy, I believe that it's become more important than ever that we stay the course and that we continue to invest in renewables and electrification. 
the requirement for urgent action on climate change is increasingly clear and I think the Minister called it out, the electricity sector remains uniquely positioned to make a difference here by eliminating, uh, reducing first and then eliminating carbon in our electricity and then using that clean electricity to displace carbon in transport and in heat and in industry, we can eliminate up to 50% of Ireland's carbon emissions through clean electricity alone. For Ireland to reach net zero, the electricity, will, uh, electricity sector is going to have to uh, lead out. The Climate Action Plan target of 80% of renewable electricity by 2030 is a critical staging post. Delivering this is going to be quite a challenge. But to anybody who doubts Ireland's capability to deliver, I ask you to look back at what's happened over the last 15 years and what the electricity sector has already delivered and how far the electricity sector has already come. In the 15 years since 2005, the carbon intensity of electricity in Ireland has more than halved, from over 600 grams per kilowatt hour to under 300. Ireland met its targets set in 2008 for 40% of electricity for renewables by 2020, from renewables by 2020. By 2020, electricity accounted for closer to 15% of Ireland's overall carbon emissions, down from 20% back in the 1990s. And now we have over five gigawatts of renewables connected directly into our transmission and distribution networks. That's not far away from Ireland's peak demand. And it's a reminder that when the electricity sector pulls together and works together, it can deliver transformational change. So that bodes well for the future, but the path ahead is going to be steeper. And to get to 80% by 2030, Ireland needs to build and connect more than one gigawatt of renewables a year for the rest of the decade. It means that developers collectively will have to build, and ESP networks and NIE networks and AirGrid and Sony will have to connect at an average rate that's more than double that in the last decade. But this year, ESP networks is going to connect more than 700 megawatts of renewables to our uh, electricity network, along with further battery storage. And that gives hope that we're in touching distance of delivering on this rate of more than one gigawatt uh, a year. ESB's modeling projects that, along with the retirement of more carbon intensive generation, such as Money Point, the scale of delivery of renewables that we're anticipating will reduce the carbon intensity of Ireland's electricity to between 60 and 70 grams per kilowatt hour by 2030. Um, as Derville said in, in her introduction, earlier on this year, ESB published, we published our new strategy, uh, setting ourselves a net zero target by 2040. We believe that the electricity sector has to get there early so that clean electricity can be part of solving uh, and getting to net zero in other parts of the economy. That net zero target for us isn't just directed at our generation portfolio. It extends to all of our operations, to our buildings and to our fleets. And we've more than halved the energy usage and the, car or the carbon intensity of our uh, fleets and buildings over the last number of years. It links to our commitment to support the wider decarbonisation of society through smart and resilient networks and through customer-focused products and services. And we're focusing our efforts on three main objectives. The first one is generating and connecting more clean electricity. Oops. Um, and making sure, yeah. So and we're targeting a five-fold five increase in the amount of renewable generation this decade. That's primarily going to be onshore wind, solar, and offshore wind. And in this, the offshore wind is going to provide the real scale. ESB networks and NIE networks are both working on increasing their capacity and their capability to connect more renewable generation to the, to the networks. And our modeling shows that we'll, Ireland will need uh, about three or maybe more gigawatts of offshore wind generation to get connected by 2030 uh, in order to achieve our uh, renewable goals. Generating and connecting more electricity is going to be really, or more renewable electricity is going to be really important, but our second objective looks beyond that. It looks at how we can use the clean electricity to help play our part uh, in supporting the customers and the communities we serve 
to uh, re reduce the carbon intensity in their lives. And this is where we can really leverage Ireland's investment in the renewable generation. Um, not just eliminating uh, carbon from electricity, but eliminating carbon from about 50% of final energy demand. Electric vehicle technology and heat pumps can help increase Ireland's independence from fossil fuels and reduce our exposure from volatile energy prices. By 2030, uh, in ESB, we plan to double the number of public charge point uh, infrastructure that we have, and we expect many other charge point operators to be doing the same, helping to support the adoption of EVs that Laura was mentioning and pushing carbon further and further out of transport. We've, we've also partnered over the last year with Tipperary Energy Agency to create Electric Ireland Super Homes, one of a number of one-stop shops for home retrofits. These retrofits allow customers to access government supports and to create warmer, healthier, more efficient homes, and critically, to replace carbon-intense heating with electric heat pumps. I visited one of these homes a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's really interesting. You can see the customers going from a diesel car and a coal fire and uh, gas heating to an electric car, an electric fire, an electric heat pump, solar panels on the roof, and of course, a smart meter. And smart meters are going to play an increasingly important role on the rollout of 2.3 million meters by ESB networks on behalf of the CRU by 2025 will help suppliers and customers and communities to play their part in, uh, in the clean energy transition, shifting demand to beat the peak or to favor low carbon generation times. But ultimately, these initiatives are really about empowering customers and communities to leverage clean electricity and new technologies to support Ireland's tran uh, transition to net zero. Last year, ESB Networks completed a really nice project in Dingle, looking at how customers engaged with those smart technologies. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion later on this afternoon uh, about empowering customers and communities. As the electrification of transport and heat gathers pace, we expect electricity demand to rise from about 35 terawatt hours a year at the moment to 50 terawatt hours a year by 2040. So it's a big increase in demand. Of course, this implies an increasing dependence also on electricity at the same time as we're transitioning to an energy system based largely on intermittent renewable generation. So even before the issue of energy security was driven into the spotlight by the events in Ukraine, we identified resilient infrastructure as our third strategic objective. Finding effective ways to store our surplus clean electricity to use at times when the renewables aren't producing will be absolutely critical into 2030 and beyond, as will the development of new services to help system operators to cope with a high volume of intermittent renewables. Periods of low wind and no wind will always exist, so collectively we have to plan for a future where there's no wind in the system and we can provide backup for, the, for, for days at the time. In the short term, this means investing in flexible gas turbines with the intention that these operate only when the wind isn't blowing and when renewables aren't produ producing. And we have three of these projects underway at the moment. And I think it's really important that we're, we're building into this to support confidence in energy security um, around this clean transition. But ultimately, to get to 80% renewables and beyond, we see hydrogen from the end of the decade starting to play a key role in providing this capability for balancing renewable electricity generation and also empowering the sectors that are hard to electrify. And I'm looking forward to, to Claire Jackson's presentation later on when we talk about the role of hydrogen in that, in that area. We're planning to build a hydrogen capability um, and as part of our Green Atlantic project at Money Point, and we're examining the infrastructure needed to support Ireland's hydrogen economy. We're working on a number of lighthouse projects to showcase smart, in integrated, zero emission transport industry and dispatchable power generation using renewable hydrogen and we're working with others to explore the development of suitable hydrogen storage options around the country. The scale of the investment required is enormous, and uh, Laura showed us that scale at an international level. It means a large increase in cap capital intensity is required for the electricity sector. This year, ESB will invest over 1.2 billion 
in critical infrastructure to support the transition. And we'll see that increasing over the rest of the decade uh, significantly up towards two billion. Of course, this is gonna be really difficult for companies and for, for the country, given the environment of a cost of living crisis and electricity prices driven up by the cost of the wholesale of wholesale gas on the international markets. But it's really important that to, to emphasize that now is the very time, it's the very time that we have to stay the course and continue to make investments in renewables. Uh, and so the continuing support of an investable market structures and regulatory frameworks that we have in Ireland at the moment are, are gonna be really important. Our modeling, when we model business as usual, in other words, the continuation of Ireland's existing policies out to 2030 with renewable supports continuing beyond, uh, we project a carbon intensity of electricity of about 66 grams per kilowatt hour by 2030. Getting that 66 grams per kilowatt hour down further by 2040 will take more than renewables alone. Reaching net zero is gonna require hydrogen production and storage infrastructure, as well as renewables integrated to provide the equivalent of a zero carbon dispatchable generation capability. I believe that it's within reach, but we need to continue to act collectively and we need to act quickly. Critically, we need to increase the funnel of offshore wind projects and I welcome the government's increase in the targets to seven gigawatts. And we need to maximize the use of our existing infrastructure and assets to be able to bring this uh, additional offshore wind ashore using hybrid connections and the transmission infrastructure that we already have. We need to start developing floating offshore on the south and west coasts now, aiming for a steady drumbeat of projects to build and sustain our offshore wind supply chain and we need to start getting the infrastructure in place to support hydrogen production, storage, and dispatchable generation. And in summary then, clean electricity, I believe, is gonna be the backbone of Ireland's future zero carbon energy system. As we continue to decarbonize electricity and to electrify heat and transport, we have the potential through clean electricity to eliminate over 50% of Ireland's energy carbon emissions with the added benefit now of protecting our long-term energy security and gaining independence from costly and volatile imported fossil fuels. While the pace of the delivery required is accelerating, and we'll hear a lot more about that at the conference today, most of the technologies we need are already available, and there is, I believe, a feasible uh, pathway um, available to us and ahead of us. It does mean effectively doubling the run rate of renewables being developed and connected to networks by the end of the decade. But our 2022 20, uh, delivery of 700, more than 700 megawatts of, of renewable generation connected means that we're in, within touching distance of that and that level of scale is in reach. It means beginning now on areas like uh, offshore wind and hydrogen, and particularly hydrogen now, so that by 2030, Hydrogen or an equivalent balancing mechanism is ready to start supporting an integrated renewable energy system effectively capable of providing the equivalent of dispatchable zero carbon electricity. And most importantly, it means continuing to invest despite the cost of living crisis, continuing to invest in renewables so that we can continue to make a tangible and lasting difference. A difference not only in, in increasing Ireland's energy independence, but a fundamental difference in delivering urgent action to combat climate change, in eliminating over 50% of Ireland's energy emissions, and in leading the transition to a low carbon net zero future through renewable electricity. Thank you very much.